Hello again. Today we're going to learn about working capital management. Let's jump in. Managing working capital is very important for a business. It's one of those issues of having just the right amount, kind of like Goldilocks. You know, you don't want it too hot, you don't want it too cold. If you have too much working capital, you could forego profits. But if you have too little working capital, you could reduce profits and lead to unnecessary short-term expenses. So the question of getting it just right, part of that depends on the taste for risk of the management and leadership of the organization. We'll start with some definitions though. Working capital is the total current assets of the organization. And that, in, remember, current refers to the liquidity level. Assets that are either liquid right now, cash right now, or realizable within the next year. So things that will turn into cash soon. Accounts receivable, marketable securities, we could go and sell those any day at pretty much their full market value. Uh, inventory, to a greater or lesser extent, prepaid expenses. Now we want to distinguish net working capital. That's total current assets minus current liabilities. So assuming we had to pay off all of our liabilities today, how much current assets would we actually have remaining? That's the net amount. And managing working capital is necessary, as I mentioned, to keep costs down. Uh, storage of inventory, you know, the inventory is a big deal. Inventory costs money, not only to produce, but to keep on hand. To have a lot of inventory, we have to have warehouse space. We have to have clerks keeping track of it. We might have to have security if it's valuable. That costs money. So the less inventory we have, the less money we have to spend on holding inventory, the more money we could spend on investing whether on passive investments like stocks and bonds or actively investing money back into the company operations. So we want to recognize uh, when we talk about inventory, which seems like a, a good thing to have, well, it's, it's not good to have too much because there's always an opportunity cost with any action. We want to keep those costs under control. Likewise, we want to keep risk levels appropriate. Keep enough liquidity to deal with situations that come up. You know, Keep a cushion of, of cash in the business to deal with contingencies. You don't want to get the cash level too low because then you could be in trouble. Usually you could borrow cash in the short run, but that might cost you. You might have to sell off assets in a fire sale or get some like emergency lines of credit, which could be difficult to obtain. Okay, now, as I've mentioned, it's this Goldilocks thing of getting it just right. So how do we determine the correct level of working capital? We have to consider risk and return and then benefits and costs. Benefit of having more working capital is, is having higher liquidity, which reduces the risk of running out of money and then as I mentioned, selling stuff or having to borrow in the short run. But there's cost of working capital too, and that's lower returns. Holding too much working capital, we're either holding cash, which pays no return, or we're holding really short-term liquid securities, which are going to pay a really low rate of return. And the alternative, we could invest in, in other securities, or better yet, invest in our own production, which would have the highest return of all, hopefully if we're a, a healthy, profitable enterprise. Okay, so to illustrate that risk return trade-off, let's look at uh, two companies side by side. We'll start with Firm 1. We're basically looking at their balance sheet accounts on the top, and then on the bottom we're looking at um, a, a really pared down income statement. Firm 1 has no marketable securities, 200 million in current assets, 800 million in fixed assets for a total asset base of a billion, uh, 100 million in short-term debt, 400 in long-term debt, 500 in common stock. So they're pretty split evenly between debt and equity financing. Half of its debt, half of its equity for total liabilities and equity of a billion. So the balance sheet balances as it should. And then operating earnings, 150 million. No interest because they're not holding any securities here in their current assets. Uh, earnings before taxes, 150 million. Subtract the tax rate of 40%. We got net income of 90. Okay, now from that we can go ahead, remember back to uh, financial statement analysis. Let's calculate the current ratio, which is the measure of liquidity. So 200 in current assets divided by 100 in current liabilities. So we've got a nice current ratio of 2. Remember, that's kind of the rule of thumb. You want that to be 2 or higher to be sufficiently liquid. Okay, now let's think about the return on assets. Net income divided by assets. We've got net income of 90 million, assets of a, a billion. So our return on assets is 9%. Uh, is that good or bad? It kind of depends on cost of capital and expectations, riskiness, but let's just say that's good for now. And now we will throw in Firm 2 for a comparison. Firm 2 is deciding to issue more equity. So they've ratcheted up their equity issuance. And remember, equity typically costs more than debt, both short and long term, because you have to pay those higher returns of stock market because, because you have to pay those higher returns on stock because stock is considered a more risky investment. And 
by increasing their equity, that's enabled them to increase their working capital. Their total working capital would be all the current assets. Their net working capital would be the 400 here in total current assets minus the 100 in short-term liability. So they've got substantially more working capital, and they've decided to park that extra working capital in short-term bonds. In this case, they're buying these securities to earn a little bit of extra interest on the side. And so we see that here with the higher net income. They've earned an extra uh, $8 million in interest, presuming these short-term securities pay 4%. So that boosts their earnings and then increases their taxes a little bit. So the net income only goes up by uh, $5 million because we're dealing with a, a high tax bracket here. So let's see what the effect of that is on liquidity and returns. Current ratio is 4. We've doubled the current assets and had no change in short-term liabilities because remember we financed the acquisition of that of those securities with equity. So we we boosted the liquidity. Uh, some might say needlessly. If two was a sufficient current ratio, well, it's needless to, to hold more than that. And we we got to consider: is it worthwhile to invest in these short-term securities that only pay four percent? Well, look what it did to our ROA, return on assets. Income went up a little bit, but proportionately, the uh, capital, the equity we had to raise to acquire that income went up a lot more. So that actually drove return on assets down. So was it worth it? Well, kind of depends. Is this rate below a threshold? This rate is substantially lower than this rate. So the point is that if you're more liquid, you're less risky, but you're going to have a lower return on assets if you're, that's firm too, if you're less liquid and riskier, you're able to achieve a higher return on assets. That's the fundamental trade-off here, liquidity versus profitability. Our book talks about that a lot. Firm 1 here represents leaning towards the profitability end of that spectrum, and Firm 2 represents being at the liquidity, more towards the liquidity end of that spectrum. Okay, now we want to kind of map out how assets change over time. Presumably the fixed assets don't change much over time, and so in this business, we have uh, 5 million of fixed assets, and that just chugs along. We see we have the time scale on the x-axis and total assets on the y. And as we go forward in time like this, fixed assets don't really change much, assuming zero growth. Now, most companies, that would kind of tick up uh, over time gradually as they uh, grow slowly and steadily. Okay, then permanent current assets. A chunk of the current assets is kind of always going to be there. We always have some cash in the bank. We always have something in our accounts receivable. We always have some level of prepaid expenses, so on and so forth. So there's some component of current assets that's always around. In this case, $2 million worth is always going to be on the books. And then there's an additional amount that fluctuates. Sometimes it's close to zero, and then sometimes in this example, it adds uh, $3 million of additional current assets. And that would be based on like seasonal factors, you know, com businesses that have a lot of sales in a particular season, uh, generate a lot of accounts receivable in that season, and so the current temporary current assets would increase. The sales go down in the off season, accounts receivable are, are paid, and hence those temporary current assets um, ebb and flow, as it were. And so this uh, fluctuation is something we want to keep in mind when we're considering working capital management, because uh, if we want to keep current assets at a certain level, we're going to have to kind of balance out the lean times here where, temp where temporary current assets decline with the flush times here. So in flush times, we might have all the current assets we want to, to establish our liquidity level, but in these lean times here and here, we're going to have to fill in with some maybe uh, additional short-term debt get some lines of credit or, or issue some commercial paper or something like that in order to acquire some additional cash or securities that we could use as a current assets buffer. Okay, so the big takeaway in the book is that there's three different approaches to working capital management. Aggressive, conservative, and moderate, and we'll look at them in that order. The aggressive approach, uh, the, the you know, remember the, the profitability versus liquidity trade-off and as you might guess, the aggressive approach says, let's focus on making as much profit as possible and kind of forget about liquidity or, or minimize liquidity. So we're going to finance all the temporary current assets, permanent current assets, and even some of our fixed assets with short-term debt. Now, you might be thinking already, boy, that that's risky. It's risky to finance everything. It's risky to be highly leveraged. I think we've talked about that a little bit. And yes, it's true. Why is it risky to be highly leveraged? Well, the reasons are that... Even though short-term debt costs less, 
interest rates can change. So short-term interest rates can go up on you, and that increases the cost of rolling over short-term debt. And also, if the business has some has some down periods, if, if the business has a bad quarter or a bad year where it loses money, uh, those, those liabilities are now pressing, and how are you going to pay them if you don't have net income? You're going to have to liquidate some other assets. You might have to sell off parts of the business. Uh, that, that's going to be bad news, especially if, if we think the, the downtime is eventually going to end. We have to give somebody else uh, part of our business when things are going to recover in the future. And so we're actually going to reduce our net equity and our net investment just because we got too overburdened with short-term debt. So uh, it's, it's tempting in the short run, but it can be really dangerous to get over leveraged, especially with short-term debt. Now, you can be leveraged with long-term debt too, but the benefit of that is that it's, it's not all due in the near term. And so you can ride out downturns and down times uh, easier if, if your debt structure is more oriented towards longer term. And here's what the aggressive approach would look like in terms of that, um, that time sequence of the assets. So the, the 5 million in fixed assets here is going to be funded only partially by long-term sources like equity or long-term debt, bonds, for example. And then part of our long-term assets, all of our permanent current assets, and then all of our temporary current assets are financed by short-term sources, short-term debt. Again, high risk, high return. If we don't make much money, boy, we've got a lot of short-term debt that we have to pay. And if we're losing money in the short run, that's going to drain down our equity. And that's bad news. The book has this nice little setup, uh, additionally, to kind of explain in terms of looking at the balance sheet. And we're just kind of picturing the size, the relative size of these categories with these boxes. So, that, of course, assets equals liabilities. I should add here liabilities plus equity. Okay, so the size of this box is the dollar value of assets. The size of this whole box here is the dollar value of liabilities and equity. And this is kind of mapping out how, what an aggressive capital management system would look like. We've financed the bulk of our current assets here, both temporary and permanent, with current liabilities, leaving a very narrow range here of net working capital. Remember, net working capital is all of your current assets minus all of your current liabilities. So this is if we if we settled up with all of our creditors right now, this little slice right here would be our remaining working capital. Okay, The aggressive approach loads up heavily on current liabilities rather than longer term liabilities and equity to finance more of the assets small net working capital position and that again attests to the high risk down times come we're going to have our net working capital wiped out pretty quick and if net working capital gets wiped out and we still have bills to pay guess what's going to happen we're going to have to tap into the long-term fixed assets and reduce the, some of the equity because if we reduce this we're going to have to reduce this as well ultimately that's going to hit our equity which you know we, we really don't want to do we don't want to give away equity we want to grow equity if we want to keep this business going on and, and building shareholder value into the future. Okay, now let's uh, look at the conservative approach. We're going to finance all fixed assets, permanent current assets, and some temporary with long-term debt or equity. Short-term financing is, is only a little bit that's going to be used for some of the temporary current assets. This is a lower risk, lower return approach. We can look at it both in the sense of this timeline. So here, all of our fixed assets here all of our permanent current assets and the bulk of our temporary current assets are financed with in what's in blue here is long-term sources debt well, let's say long-term debt or equity equity is is even longer term equity you know lasts forever at least it lasts as long as the business does long-term debt could last 10 or, or 30 years equity lasts indefinitely and then we only use short-term sources you know short-term debt line of credit from the bank, commercial paper, something like that, to finance just a little bit up here. So this is ultra safe. So if bad times come and, and we're losing money, uh, it's really easy to, li to liquidate. There's a very small liability burden, and it's really easy to take care of that. We could dip in maybe to, to our temporary current assets, or if things got really bad, dip in a little bit to our permanent current assets. But we're probably not going to have to dip too far into that in order to take care of our short-term debt. And that's going to leave our equity intact and let us ride out a downturn. Here's what that looks like in the balance sheet management sense. Okay, we've we've got a really small amount of current liabilities here, and it's just a portion of our temporary current assets, and therefore a very large remaining area of net working capital. And that's a cushion, right? You want to think about the net working capital is the cushion for the company to ride out a down time. 
either a downtime in terms of lower sales, lower revenue, uh, lower profits, or even losses, or just you know a period where things are slack and there's not a lot of growth. Networking capital equals a cushion. So if you're more risk averse, you want a, a bigger cushion. And we're relying more on longer term financing, debt, long term debt and equity to finance the vast bulk of the assets on our balance sheet. Okay, then finally, the moderate approach, which this is kind of the Goldilocks theme where we're kind of hitting a sweet spot maybe in between the aggressive and conservative approaches. The aggressive approach may be too risky, even though it might give you some more profit, it's too risky. The conservative approach, even though it's really safe, uh, it reduces profits too much. So can we find a sweet spot in the middle? And the answer is yes. We kind of go halfway between the conservative and aggressive methods. So we're going to finance fixed assets and permanent current assets with long-term funding long-term debt or equity, and then finance basically all of the temporary current assets with short-term financing. Moderate risk, moderate return with the moderate approach. Here's what that looks like in terms of our timeline. So fixed plus permanent current assets, all financed with long-term debt and equity, and then all of our temporary current assets fin financed with short-term sources, short-term debt, and then finally, what does that look like in balance sheet management terms? Here you see the exact match between temporary current assets and current liabilities. And then everything else, permanent current assets and long-term fixed assets, exactly matches long-term uh, financing. And so we've got a, a moderate-sized networking capital position. Moderate networking capital position. So we, we, we've got enough cushion there, but it's not too big of a cushion. And therefore, we can still boost our profits a little bit by relying more on lower cost, short term financing, current liabilities. So we can kind of maybe view that as the sweet spot. Okay, so there you have it, working capital management. That's just a, a kind of quick overview, but that gives us some very powerful tools that we can use, uh, even in a really small business setting.